The World Series of Poker main event starts this week, and whether you're a sports better or a card player, or maybe you've always wanted to be one of the two, uh, there's a great opportunity to learn here. And we're joined by the legendary poker player, Chris Moneymaker. He's here with us to shed a little light on all the skills that he's picked up over the course of 15 World Series of Poker main events. Uh, there's also times in our life where maybe we could use a bit of a poker face that maybe we didn't anticipate. And also you can use the moneymaker mindset. Uh, and he's here on behalf of Velo to teach us a little bit more about how we can take all these different strategies and actually apply them to real life. So Chris, a pleasure to meet you. Appreciate uh, you making some time for us today. I I'd love to start off uh, by having you talk about that moment, maybe early on in your professional career, when you actually came to the realization that these lessons, these moments of opportunity at the poker table could actually be applied uh, in these non-poker situations. When did that light bulb click for you? Uh, it was actually, it took quite a while, to be honest, because, um, you know, I guess right after I won, you go through this whole whirlwind of traveling the world and doing all this stuff. Um, and it wasn't until probably 10 years later that I started seeing all these interesting correlations between what you do in your everyday life, the decisions that you make, how you approach your decisions, um, how you just handle yourself in business and in personal life, and how everything that I've, most of the things I've learned on the poker table um, helps in those decisions. So it's a couple of different things. It's one, it's getting older and getting more wise probably, but two, it's, you know, the preparation and learning of how to think analytically and how to approach your decision-making process that will help um, guide you through your business decisions and also um, dealing with your spouse or, uh, you know, whatever social setting that you're in, uh, being able to potentially hide some of your displeasures and um, when your wife wants you to take out the trash for the 15th time, uh, you don't snap at her and, and just smile and be happy. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there's a lot to be able to take away from that. And also the ability, especially in sports betting, which is what we discuss primarily here at BetSided, the ability for us to be able to make a lot of those analytically driven decisions are crucial because so many times bettors are often thinking with their heart and not with their head. So we'll get with that, get to that in just a minute. But um, how did Velo end up contacting you, working together to be able to put together the, the moneymaker mindset and apply all of these to more than just the poker table? How did that partnership start? Well, the partnership has kind of started. So Velo signed on as a, one of the major sponsors of the WSOP. And Velo does a lot of lifestyle um, concepts and, you know, promotions and uh, things like that. So they looked for an expert in the field and uh, looking for someone that could speak to how you translate from poker into real work, into the real world. And uh, that's just something I was working on in a corporate setting. I've done some corporate speak uh, speeches about it and things of that nature. And we connected and it was a great fit. And uh, been, it's been great working with them. We, we shot some videos. We, we've written some other stuff about, you know, how to handle, you know, things such as a, a holiday parties or a business function, you know, going to a Christmas party, for example, going on a blind date or a, any date. Um, you know, several different social settings and business settings. And uh, yeah, it's been a great relationship and uh, it's been a lot of fun working with them. And uh, the, the videos that they put together are, are pretty comical and they're pretty fun to do. A lot of these different skill sets when you're playing poker can actually correlate well with sports betting. And, and there's been a lot of folks too that have been outstanding poker players that are also good professional batters uh, that have been very successful in the fantasy space as well. But I think for anyone that might be watching us today that are unfamiliar of how the two get correlated, I was hoping we could go over some of them. So first of all, you know, bankroll is essential. Whether or not you know and make sure the amount of chips that you're playing each hand is going to, to correlate long term versus just going all in on an aggressive bet when maybe you would necessarily need to do that. How do you handle in particular understanding bankroll as a poker player and also what it's like to deal with some of these swings when a lot of money is going back and forth on a single hand? Well, that just comes with practice and it comes with discipline. I mean, the, the biggest thing is I can't tell you how many friends and how many people I've known that are phenomenal poker players and they're waiting tables, serving, you know, selling cars, doing, they're doing something else because they don't have bankroll management. They can't uh, 
do the first part. The first part is the most important part. And that's the bankroll management side of things. I mean, obviously, you know, you can go put a thousand lineups in the, um, the million dollar uh, DraftKings uh, event um, and take one big massive shot at it, but that's going to destroy your bankroll. Most people's bankroll. I mean, it's obviously much better to fire a couple here and there. Um, but at the end of the day, you play within your means. Sometimes, um, you know, if you have a thousand dollar bankroll, you can't go play a hundred dollar tournament. I mean, you, you can play 10 tournaments and you're broke and chances are that's going to happen. So unless you can yourself go play a $1 buy-in tournament on your thousand dollar bankroll, you're never going to be successful. It doesn't matter how good a poker player you are or how good you are at DFS. If you don't stay in it for the long run, you're going to go broke. And I'm a bad DFS player. I'll be the first to admit it. I'm, I'm terrible. And I, I'm, you know, pay for sites and I try to get advice. I'm a sports fan and I'm still just absolutely horrible at DFS. Like I'm, I play in a league and I've consistently, I'm in the bottom tier of the league every single week. So I've got a really good talent at being bad at DFS. (laughs) Um, If there's going to be a guy that's going to get hurt, I'm going to find him. So, but the thing is, is I don't put a whole lot of money in each week. It's, you know, I set up a plan for the entire you know, season. And I know how much I'm going to spend every single week. Unfortunately, almost every week that that allotment's gone by the time it's done, because I do play mostly tournaments. Um, And the one thing you have to realize is, you know, obviously, if you're playing tournaments versus cash games, in both poker and DFS, you have different bankroll requirements. So if I'm playing tournaments in poker or DFS, I know there's going to be a lot more volatility, a lot more variance, and I'm going to have to play a much smaller amount of my bankroll in these versus in the cash games where theoretically I'm supposed to win some of the time and my can, I can play a little bit bigger uh, because, you know, the, the bankroll is going to last longer because, you know, I, I should win a couple of weeks here and there uh, just based on pure math that I could, I should get lucky every once in a while and not just completely get punted every week. Well, speaking of the math, I'm also curious to get your thoughts on, you know, in sports betting, a lot of the times, and the biggest piece of advice that they'll offer to newer sports bettors is to, to bet the number and not the team. Now, obviously, when you're playing poker, the hand matters, and ultimately the first round of betting is, is crucial and essential. But um, talk me through sort of that process when you know you've got a really good hand, but maybe uh, the amount of chips that you have on the table may not necessarily work out. What are your strategies at that point? Uh, knowing when to be really aggressive there or versus trying to slow play it a little bit. Well, the the difference between like sports betting and poker, for example, is, you know, obviously with poker, you're dealing with individuals, you're dealing with other people. So the ability to be aggressive or to scale back is a lot, depending upon your opponent, depending upon what their range is, perceived range and what your range is. And a lot of what you're doing is matching range versus range and, uh, you know, matching basically if your opponent's going to call off or he's going to be bluffed too easy, that's how you sort of figure out your bet size and, and your race sizing. Where in uh, sports, obviously it's a little bit different because you're not dealing with that. You're dealing, I mean, honestly, in sports, really all you're dealing with is, you know, I guess the, the steam and figuring out which way the, the number is going to move. If you want to play it earlier in the week, or you want to play it later in the week. Um, and a, obviously a general rule of thumb is if you're going to play any favorites, play them early in the week. Cause usually those numbers go up, especially in the big games. Um, or, you know, you play a lot of unders later in the week because they generally go up unless you see bad weather, things like that. But right. um, from a strictly perspective of like when to go for it, um, it's really at the end of the day uh, in poker based on your opponent and in sports. I mean, you know, you're what I used to always do when I bet sports and I still do, but not as much as I used to. I would always go in the week before and I would set the line. Uh, me and my buddy would always set the line, what we think is going to be the next week's games. And we would always be one or two points off at most. Um, and if we were ever more than that, that's obviously a game we were going to bet unless there were, we'd have to go find if there was some kind of injury. But um, but we knew going into the week because we had done our prior work going into it. And that, that's what a lot of you know poker players, a lot of math people do. They They figure out what the number should be beforehand and that's you know that's how most people bet um that do it well and do it significantly well um obviously there's so many syndicates and everything out there that are giving away games and they 
make these lines deviate so much, but uh, having a good plan going into the week will help. A couple other applicable skills that I want to get your perspective on. Uh, certainly one of them in particular is sort of the notion, you, you mentioned this in one of the videos that you guys did, knowing when to walk away. Um, but I'm also curious, based on your skill set and the fact that you've done this professionally for so many years, are you someone that is still willing to, to walk away at times? Or have you had enough practice and expertise and, and confidence in yourself to say, you know what, I might be down here, but I can find my way back because I'm starting to figure some things out or I might be on the right track. Is, is there sort of a delicate balance between the two? It's for sure a delicate balance. In poker, it's actually pretty easy for me because I can I can identify when I'm the spot in the game or I'm the weaker player in the game. It's, it's not something that's tough to figure out. If, I, if I'm trying to put people on hands and I am just completely out in left field, just I'm off, then I'm not playing very well. I just, I'll get up and walk away. If I'm reading well and I'm playing very well, it doesn't matter. The results of winning and losing don't really matter as much as long as I'm seeing the game correctly, I'll stay in play. It's when the fact that I can't tell what my opponents are doing and I can't understand what their ranges are, that's when I know it's time to get, and I could be crushing the game, but if I can't read what my opponents doing, it might be time to get up and go. Um, where, you know, you look at sports betting or DFS, say for example, so this year, in college football, I'm just I can see the games. It's just so easy to see that essentially I'm ba I'm betting every freaking Clemson under all year long until this last week. Damn it! Um, and that's just like printing money. Like you you get into these grooves where like I see things really well in college football, but like NFL season, uh, I mean I literally I can't see a, a thing, and it's been pretty brutal. Um, and it's going to be the same way. In, in poker and sports, you get into these grooves and uh, you see these things. Do you still do a lot of your own projections for, for college football or is it more so um, just your own sort of variations of studying and, and looking at the numbers and uh, based on sort of the, the eye test for you as well? It's definitely the eye test for me. I, I, I spend a lot of time watching sports and watching college football. And the, the most important thing I always look at are the offensive and defensive lines though, that to me is where the, the games won and lost. Like, most, I mean, uh, you know, most people say, um, but I just get a feel for, you know, how good player the teams are and where they have their strengths and where they're, you know, really it's where they're overvalued. I mean, for the first seven weeks of the season, I bet everything, all the Clemson's under and every every team that was playing against Clemson because Clemson's just overvalued for what they are uh, based on, you know, just their offensive line is in shambles. So and it's really affected their game, but they're still they were for a long time. They were getting lines like they were the Clemson of last year. So you can there's a lot of value to be had in past history's games and with teams that fall off significantly. LSU was a good uh team to do that against for a long time as well uh you'll see teams like tcu even uh getting a lot more respect than they deserve based on past history um and that you know when i go to to bet and, and more specifically college than nfl is i look for the past history and where those lines are inflated especially you know when you look for the the main games that you know the monday night game or the saturday night games where you have ohio state and some other big name team you know in the scoring all the points. I, I love looking for unders in those situations because those are generally inflated. So like in poker, you're always looking for these little angles where someone's overvaluing something in sports. It's going to be the same way. You're looking for when the, the public's, you know, you know, a lot of people will look and see what side everybody's on and, you know, the people will take the, the public, uh, go against the public side or whatever. And I'm kind of doing the same thing. I just know that the public's going to be all over, um, you know, Alabama, and they're always going to be all over the Alabama over and the Oklahoma over. So I just look for good opportunities where they're playing defenses that can hold them down and uh, play the underdog and the under a lot of times. I mean, obviously, if you're a good sports better, you know, underdogs and under generally are you know, the, the better ways to go, um, even though they're painful to bet sometimes. Yeah, no doubt about it. Really good stuff. Really good information from Chris Moneymaker. He's kind enough to join us. He's here on behalf of Velo as we're getting ready for the World Series of Poker. All right, what, one last thing to be able to apply um, outside of, of the poker table, and I want to get some some stories from you as well. Um, a lot of times when you're playing with your friends, you got a, a poker game going, it's almost difficult when you get a big hand and you don't have to show your cards yet. You're almost tempted to. You want to show them, I, I got you guys, or I bluffed you the entire time, or no, I, I promise you I had a really good hand. Is there ever a time where showing your cards 
is actually an advantage? Is it a way to maybe psych out the table a little bit? Never. No, you want you want to say keep it a secret. Poker is a game of information. The more information you give away, the more information your opponents have, and therefore they can use against you. And I, you know, I've taught so many people how to play poker, and they constantly, I'm going to show my hand for this reason. Well, the problem is, is you have eight people at the poker table that are taking in that information and using it different ways. So whatever your intention is to show that, yeah, I'm bluffing more or I'm really loose, eight people are going to see it eight different ways. Uh, three people may not be paying attention one bit and they're just, it's pointless. Five people are going to see it. Well, they're going to peak. Like if I see it, I'm going to piece together what your what was your raise sizing pre-flop? What did you do throughout the hand? I don't really care what your hand was. I want to know. I would love that information so I can see, you know, did you raise 2.5x? Are you raising too wide under the gun? You know, what position were you playing this hand in? So I'm going to run that kind of analysis like you would if you're in a computer generation. Um, see, I'm going to analyze it a lot different say, than maybe you would. And, but at the same time, it doesn't matter. You're always giving away information to your table and it's just better. You, you learn over time, the amount of satisfaction you get of one second of going, aha, I got you is nothing compared to the time after time, after time, being able to get them over and over and over and knowing that you're getting them instead of just the, you know, I'm breaking my cookie moment and, you know, everybody, you know, everybody knows that you're such a great player. Um, you learn over time that that doesn't matter. You just, you, you play your hand good. You don't show anybody and you'll be much better off in the long run. I, I like that. We're still able to, to bring it back to rounders come full circle. Final, final question that I have for you, Chris. And again, I appreciate getting the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, bad beats. Ta constantly talked about in the sports betting world, uh, but it's certainly a topic of conversation whenever you're playing poker as well. Is there one in particular, whether or not it happened to you, uh, somebody you know at the table that has just been ingrained in your mind and you, and you think, all right, the number one bad beat that I've ever seen uh, in a game of poker. Uh, do you remember what it was and, and just how bad was it? Well, first of all, did I not just mention the Clemson game last week? Um <laughs> For that Clemson was about game. as bad as you could get, especially if you had the under in that one, or if you had Florida State plus the points. Like I just said, I bet a lot of underdogs and unders when Clemson oh, plays. So that's, a, um, that's yeah. a dagger. Yeah, it was a it was a bad that was a bad beat. I remember it was pretty fresh. But <laughs> from a poker standpoint, the worst bad beat I can remember. You know, one of the things when you when you're a poker player, like it's the most criminal thing in the world to do is to, to tell a bad beat story, like. Um, I can always tell, this is like one of the biggest tells is if someone's telling me a bad beat story, I know they're not a seasoned professional poker player because no pro poker player that's been playing for a long time will ever tell you a bad beat story. It's like so very rare in today's game. Uh, 10 years ago, I mean, it was like everybody on every break. Oh my God, you'll never believe what happened. This is the worst <laughs> thing ever. Um, but in today's game, it's very rare that you see it happening, but the one, the only one that really sticks out to me that I remember I was playing in Daytona beach and they had a bad beat jackpot down there to where, um, it was like $150,000 or something, um, in the jackpot. Well, I was playing in a, in a, in a five ten game. I was sitting with 10,000. Another guy was sitting with 10,000. There was an uncapped game, uh, down there. And I had the eight, nine of spades and the flop came seven, 10 Jack all spades. So I flopped the straight flush. First time I've ever in my life dropped a uh, flop to straight flush and uh, pre flop, like he had raised, I had re raised, and he had re raised, and I had called. And on the flop, uh, I checked, he bet, I raised, he re raised, I re raised, and then just he moved all in. And I'm like, let's go, you know, get ten thousand dollars in on this flop all day long. Obviously, it, you know, I've got the the mortal lock, I can't, I can't lose. And the, you know, the river comes out queen ace of spades <laughs> and uh, he has pocket Kings with the king of spades. So he makes the bigger straight foot. He makes a, a Royal flush, which beats my straight flush. Oh. Um, and not only did I lose the hand, which obviously hurt, it sucked, but I thought I had won the bad beat jackpot because my straight flush got beat by another straight flush. So I thought, you know, I want a, a big portion of the $150,000 bad beat jackpot. So like, oh, cool. You know, I won this anyways. Well, the qualification is you have to use both cards and how the board ran out. 
I didn't use both cards because of how the but straight ran out. I didn't use my bottom card. So uh, I did not qualify for the bad beat jackpot either. So that that's the one that really kind of sticks with me. And uh, I, I really can't forget. Now, obviously there's tons that uh, you kind of remember and uh, there's tons like, I'm, I'm unique. And I remember the bad beats I put on people. And that's one thing I do to get over bad beats, like the, the Clemson bad beat this past weekend. I remember the times when, you know, I needed the the block punt, the, the Steeler block punt that gets returned for a touchdown to cover the spread. I mean, I remember the good beats as well. And that helps you when you take the devastating losses. And, uh, you know, uh, people always ask, you know, how do you get over the bad beats and how do you get over that stuff? It's if you make the correct decisions going into it and, you know, you make plus EV decisions, then, you know, you don't get results oriented. You don't worry about the decisions. A lot of the times I bet games, I don't ever watch them um, just because, you know, I'm, I'm betting it on the number. I'm not really betting the teams. No, obviously, you know, Sunday night football, I'll be betting the game just because I want to watch it and it's more fun if you have action. So um, sports a little bit different for me. I do some for entertainment and some for um, trying to make money. If there's if there's a few things that I can take away from from our conversation today, it's the first is I know that I can get rid of my tell because you and I had the same one. You ended up having a World crazy. Series of poker victory. Um, I've also learned constant Clemson unders over the course of the year and underdog. So we can go ahead and just go ahead and, and lock that in at uh, Louisville plus three and a half at home this week over 46 and a half over at WinBet. Uh, and most importantly is making sure that that bankroll stays under control because even some of the best poker players in the world, if they don't have that, they're not gonna be successful for very long. Chris, this has been an absolute pleasure. I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to get to know you. Thanks so much for uh, helping us out with the moneymaker mindset and making us all a little bit smarter heading into holiday season and uh, enjoy the World Series of Poker. We'll enjoy uh, watching it and uh, best of luck. We'll look forward to doing this again soon. For sure. Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. Good talking to you and I look forward to doing it again.